Sarah Woodward, welcome hey. to Bridging the Gap. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, Matt. We didn't even plan this. It just goes to show that plans are meant to be messed up because this uh, was not planned and it turned out to be perfect. Uh, we're, you launched a new business. We're going to talk about that today. So congratulations on that. We'll dive into it in a second, but uh, that's exciting. So this is going to be a, a fun conversation um, it, with the, the endeavor there. Uh, we're going to talk all about AI. We're going to dive deep into it, more on the the utilization of it, how to make it uh, create efficiencies. What are the value props? How do we intertwine it to our business? How do we leverage it? How do we stay on top of it? There's so much moving parts of AI in this realm. And I know some people may be tired of talking about it, but this is going to be hopefully a, a different perspective. And, and and we'll go with it from the growth ops spot. So um, before we dive into that, um, tell me a little bit about you. What did the... What did the 13-year-old Sarah Woodward want to be when she grew up? So 13-year-old Sarah wanted to be a fashion designer. And uh, the funny thing is, is I actually did apprentice with a Russian designer here in Atlanta. Uh, that was probably about 25 years ago. Um, but yeah, I had all this creativity and didn't quite know what to do with it. Fashion designer. So are you know, still find yourself, do you still find yourself drawn to fashion design elements and stuff that you learned 25 years ago, but I know maybe not on a professional level, but on a, you know, are you still yeah. focused on that to some extent? I mean, you know, the thing is, is I really still love the feel of really nice fabric. I really like to, I notice like the cut of, of different pieces of clothing. I do like to wear clothes. However, I'm also just like a good old t-shirt and jeans kind of gal as well. But I really, I don't know. Fashion is yet another kind of art. I love that. And I mean, it, it speaks volumes to your career as well, right? Creativity, artistic ability, innovation, it kind of aligns and it, and it kind of, it, it, it's a good precursor to highlighting where you've gone with your career. But tell yeah. us a little bit about that journey from 13 year old fashion designer, Sarah Woodward, to now entrepreneur of AI growth ops and, and a company that's serving uh, companies to help them you know, become more efficient using yeah, AI and innovation. Absolutely. Well, thank you. You know, I started off my career uh, in marketing. Like I think a lot of people who get into innovation eventually. Um, but yeah, uh, what I realized is that I loved storytelling and I loved thinking about messaging and I loved thinking about customers. And so early in my career, I didn't necessarily have, uh, I wasn't really developed with the perspective of human centered, you know, marketing or human centered design or any of these things. It was just more pr traditional, um, product and marketing, but I really got exposed to customer journeys. And so really started to understand how do people make decisions about what they buy or what they do or, you know, these things. Which, of course, eventually, when you start thinking about what are human problems to solve, you naturally eventually get toward product, you get toward innovation, and you just start thinking about how can we solve problems in new ways? And so during COVID, like many people, I think, all reevaluating what we wanted, want out of our lives, what we want out of our careers. I was tired of just consulting and I really wanted to start building and making an impact. And so over the last year, really dug deep into AI and figured out all of the different spaces where AI could really drive growth. And so to your point earlier about a lot of people are tired of some of the conversation, I'm not really here to talk about what is the meaning of humanity and you know, and, and partnering with AI, we've got to make smart choices, especially around data and bias and privacy and all that. But I'm really focused on how do we leverage this really cool tool to do really cool stuff? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a matter of, it's a matter of kind of putting uh, the philosophical pessimistic view aside and saying that the reality is, is that this is here and it's a, it's a little bit bigger than anybody can one person or even a group can people can stop. Um, and so it's now a matter of saying, how do we use it? How do we use it? Because humanity and better in humanity is that we need more humans to help with that. Uh, and maybe AI can give us more time to do more of that, right? It, there's another perspective to see. 
Um, the optimistic views always tended to be, you know, a little bit less of a, you know, utopia type world. And pessimism is always like, well, here's action. And so it always gets more favor. But there's a lot of opportunity with AI. And I want to dive into that in in the sense. But before we do, I want to just make sure that we all, we bring all of us listeners and, and everybody that's tuning in uh, or watching on the same page. Let's start with just something simple uh, to level set. And then we're going to dive deeper. What just start by giving a layman's explanation of generative AI and what it is um, and and maybe where it's evolved from. But what is just let's start with it. Let's all be on the same page as we then go dive deeper into the use cases and, and everything of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've actually been in the AI space for about 10 years working with uh, R&D teams and client um, companies, really thinking about how do things like machine learning and how does computer vision play a role in building products that scale across an enterprise to do X thing, right? And so artificial intelligence in the, in the, um, you know, in that respect is, you know, taking or teaching a model how to make a decision, right? And it's it's and it's programmed to make that decision. And we build models and algorithms to do those things. So they have a specific purpose. Um, and prior to now, all these things have only really been accessed through developers or data scientists or data engineers who really understand how to code, uh, how to build models, how to extract data, how to read the data, right? Well, now we're in a different place with generative. And so generative, generating something new, um, what these uh, models are now doing is through natural language processing, you know, spoken word or written word or typed word, we no longer need computer languages to talk to AI. And so there's this kind of convergence, convergence of two things. One is AI is starting to create something new, and it's now accessible to all of us who know how to use communications. Mm -hmm. And so it's really changing everything. And I think that one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is access to new jobs for people who may not have had, say, all these white collar skills in the back, you know, in, in their in their time. It might actually give them more access to understanding, like, what goes into an office job or something like that? So I think that there's a lot of things that we don't actually consider because we don't know all the possibilities. So, you know, if I were to kind of summarize it, tell me where if I'm if I'm off base here is basically pre-generative AI. And let's just use chat GPT, open AI's chat GPT as kind of the baseline for generative AI, right? Because that, that's when everybody started to realize that they can just type and solve. Pre-generative AI, you had to have coders with with data science and also data scientists or a coder with a data science background to code something and tell it what to do. And then it could go and utilizing that learnings, it could go yeah. and do. It could go yeah. and be a doer. It now could be a doer. it could go be a doer. So like a worker bee, but you had to do a ton of coding. There was some types of simple tools, but it was very hard. It's like kind of if it if this happens, then do this. If if this, this, and this happened, and it could be on massive amounts of data. Absolutely. Now, what we've done is so it went from being a doer pre open AI and ChatGPT to now being a creator. Now, having basically a mind of its own saying, um, here's all of the interpret what I'm saying and come back and think of a way to respond, execute, et cetera, in your own words. Is that, is that a fair, fair way of saying it? I'll say almost. <laughs> okay. And, and that take, is, hey, B's and C's get degrees. That's how I got through college. 100%. Um, but no, uh, so so if we think about creating something new, yes, it can because it can make really, really smart, educated guesses on what comes next. So obviously we're looking at words here when you're looking at ChatGPT. And so you're, you know, you're getting some sort of, response back that it has basically rapidly guessed what's the new word in the, in the in the chain of words based on the context it's been given and based on how it has been taught to learn and then make decisions. 
So it is not just imagining new decisions to make. It's making those choices because we've programmed it to make those choices. So, so generative AI still needs the computer programmer data scientist to build, but they've now have the tools that allow it to be accessible in a more natural language way prior to what it used to be. Is that a, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think so for sure. Yeah. Someone's got to build an LLM and train it. And you know, those things, um, those things are still not, you know, we're not doing that in a chat window necessarily. Not yet, not yet. So an LLM being a LLM being a language large, lear large language learning model that's basically yeah. interpreting all of these words, etc. And so, you know, it, it reminds me of the evolution of email, right? You know, it, it seems so simple to us, but the behind the scenes of email, there's a lot of development, there's a lot of uh, challenges that had to be solved by developer, and the same things happening with with generative AI. Okay, so we understand how it's evolved. Now it's accessible. It's now applicable to more people. It's accessible to more people. I mean, the cost is basically free. So that's why we're starting to see it more ramped up because more people can talk about it other than people just inside of the computer science and, and uh, computer science world. Right. So here's the question. It, there's a lot of headlines out there and it makes it feel or seem that AI just solves all these problems that I can just go get an AI agent. I can just go start using AI and, and everything's solved. But what, you know, these bigger companies are using AI. There's a lot that goes into preparing your business mm -hmm. to be able to leverage the benefit of AI. And so I'm, I'm curious, like, what are some of those challenges that companies run into that, that, that are roadblocks or pit stops or, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it yep. to them gaining full advantage of AI uh, that may not be perceived from the the, the novice or the beginners, uh, just kind of the the, vi the viewers viewers eyes. For sure, for sure. So on the kind of the tech and data side of things, you know, they may not have um, a lot of access to clean or reliable data. For instance, you know, they have CRMs, but there hasn't really been process or consistency in how they update information, create records, et cetera, um, or even in your tech stack. Maybe this team over here uses these tools and this team over here uses these tools. Or um, there just haven't been standardized processes over the whole company. You know, and so if you have all of these different, um, you know, kind of silos, it's harder to bring a whole company together, especially when you have to think about governance and compliance. Um, so you're having to like, okay, what's this team over here doing? What's this team over here doing? Instead of creating a few standardized processes that can be easily implemented and have safeguards built into that. Now, one of the things that is also challenging, however, is culture. You know, so has there been a culture where in the past people are allowed to play with new software? You know, are they allowed to make decisions about their workflows? Are they allowed to say, hey, I'm not comfortable using this, you know, yet, um, and I need some training? What is, you know, what's been the, the way that leadership has rolled out programs or out, you know, digital transformation or whatever? Um, so I think that, you know, it's kind of like what's your stack? What's your data and what's that culture of learning that you've, you know, kind of built and developed into your organization? You know, you mentioned something there that I, I think is super important for people to hear. And it's the it's about data. And I think that that's the biggest thing about AI that that goes um, over or just is looked over because AI doesn't solve your data mess. It can't solve your data mess because we haven't figured out how to have AI think for us. So they can't. They can interpret the data, but it's basically it's the it's a garbage in, garbage out situation. Right. Like you're 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 if you are throwing garbage in, and so you think about CRM data, you think about performance data, you think about notes data, you think about you know you talked about standardization and organization. If you don't have processes and standardization for everybody to follow it the same way, then you're not going to get the full benefit out of it. Which then says, and this is I think a challenge that we've seen within a lot of technologies is that. We think that if we just buy it, it's just going to do everything that we were shown in the demo right away. Yeah. And that's just not the nature of it, especially with AI. And you have to have clean data. You have to have, you know, 
even though it says unstructured data, you still need it to be structured in some form to be able to read it. So I think that that's false, uh, false advertising. So right. how does how does a firm, you know, call it a, a small firm, mid-sized firm, you know, that wants to start leveraging AI? How do you start cleaning the data? Where do you even start from? What does clean data mean? Like. What does organized data mean? Do I have to have like all my PDFs in one folder and my Word docs in another? Like, what does this look like? Yeah. So I think, first of all, it, de it depends on what are you trying to accomplish. So if you're trying to look at your past customer behavior history, you know, and, and what are their buying cycles? What are their buying decisions? Do they cross sell, upsell services, et cetera? Um, you need to have great CRM data and you need to have great account management data. So, like, what did the life cycle of that relationship look like? And so someone has had to have tracked all those things, right? But like, what if you are really looking to operationalize something else that's something like maybe content or something like that? Honestly, having as much data is not as critical unless you're actually trying to automate outreach. Um, and then you do need your CRM data to be you know, or at least your mailing lists to be in really great shape. You know, hopefully you're starting to track that full funnel of, you know, sales activities, marketing, performance activities, so that you can see some of these things. Um, but oftentimes these uh, data sets are in a lot of different places. And so once you think about like, okay, what is the, what's my goal? What is the type of data that I need to have in order to get to that goal? Can we start with looking at that piece and then build off of it? Because you can't go back and say, hey, we're a 15-year-old company and we're going to scrape our entire 15 years of Salesforce history. You know, that's, I mean, it's just too hard. So you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, I think that the idea of having a goal and not trying to accomplish too much, like, you know, it's taking small bite size. But, you know, I, I'm as you were talking, it kind of just dawned on me, you know, you're closer to this than I am. It, it, are you fearful that there's going to be this um, divide in you know, a further divide where the big companies are going to stand poised to benefit while the small companies can't? Because it just seems like a lot of work to to create the the appropriate data sets to get the full utilization of AI. Is that going to become the inhibitor from small companies to benefit? I think yes and no. Um, I do think that AI and uh, some automation processes can level the playing field um, quite a bit. I will say that, you know, a small company, you know, like maybe, a, you know, some sort of professional services firm or advisory firm, for instance, where you might be smaller and, you know, not looking at all the data in the world from maybe investment standpoint, but from your own customer set, it's not the same mass amounts of data that, you know, a Fortune 500 CPG company is looking at, for instance. And so I think we have different kind of different scenarios and different needs. But yes, I also feel like Smaller companies always, um, you know, have to make the decisions about where they invest their money. And so often they're probably making payroll decisions or they're making, you know, what's our next offer decision. They're not necessarily making the decisions like I can go invest in this massive, you know, tech stack around data. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons I'm kind of shifting my focus with AI grow growth ops is to focus on founders and small companies that need to do the same things that these big companies do, but you know they can't afford the overhead of some of the bigger shops. I think that it also gets into putting in controls and processes and limiting, you know, within like a CRM, for instance, right? I think about the wealth management business and, um, you know, within your CRM, as opposed to giving full freedom to choose and write in fields, whatever you want, you put controls on that. So they have selections and and that then starts to create standardized data. And maybe okay. you, you find a point in time and you just you, – you cut off and say from this time going forward, we'll build yeah. my data set. And from this time backwards, I'm just going to say it's done. And maybe over time I'll, I'll add it in. But right. you, you try not to, to eat too much. Now, you know, so we, we're talking about this and like AI is still – as much as knowledge is out there and how many tools are coming out every day and like the the, the publicity of it. AI is still really like a blank slate. It's like a blank canvas right now. You have choices. 
And we talked about, you know, we're talking about data sets. We're talking about, you know, cleanliness and processes and procedures, et cetera. And you mentioned setting a goal. But if I'm a company that's coming in and say, you know what? I have an open mind. I'm willing to go anywhere. I want. I understand the value of AI, and I understand the efficiencies it can bring. And I want to start. I want to start gaining the benefits of it. Mm-hmm. Where Where do I start? Yeah. Where do I start? I always say, "What's your biggest pain point?" So, is it sales? Is it marketing? Is it customer experience? Is it product? Where is that big mess that you kind of need to address first? Um, you know, like anything, I think you start small. And build off of that. So if you have one small area that needs attention, you know, maybe it is standardizing call center communications. Like this is a, you know, random example. Um, But, you know, we have very different customer service experiences across the company, you know, because there's no standardization. So how do we maybe start there and ensure that that first touch of, you know, um, customer brand interaction when they're coming to us with a problem is positive. And we've made sure that everyone has the same messaging, the same tool set, the same abilities to reach out and really solve problems. Um, So I'll say sales and marketing is right now the two biggest use cases. Content production optimization is the absolute biggest, um, you know, use case right now. And a lot of reasons for this, first of all, the risk is really low. You know, you're you're talking about if you have teams and you're letting them use a thing like ChatGPT, you know, putting in some of your brand messaging is not going to compromise IP or your customer data sets or anything like that, right? And so marketing tends to be one of those areas. And it's also because marketing teams really enjoy bracing and embracing new MarTech. So they're really, you know, apt to try new tools and, you know, and see the value quickly. Um, I think that, you know, there are definitely a lot of um, industries where we have to tread a little bit more carefully, um, especially in regulated ones. I know you would know this, but you cannot have a generative AI chatbot give any financial information whatsoever. So... How do you make sure you're not, that can't happen? Well, you can't use generative AI for that, you know, because it might start spouting financial information or recommendations, and that could be detrimental to a business. I, I love the idea of identifying your pain point. Yeah. Right? Identify it because it, it, there is so much that it can do. Um, you know, I always liken this to um, Michael Kitsis has the uh, FinTech landscape map for wealth managers, and it's basically gotten from like, you know, 40 companies to now it's like, I don't know, five or 600 companies. It feels like it's just, it's just huge. And everybody gets overwhelmed by it because they go and they're like, I don't know how to keep up with all this. I don't know how to choose which one I I want. And I always say, don't go looking at the map without like, it's like, that means that you're like going to the grocery store hungry. Yeah. You're going to want to go and and, and dabble and everything. You're going to buy everything that you think you're needed, but you're never going to need any of it. Um, so but I always say, go and find what your pain point is. Like, hey, I need document management. I need a new CRM. I need a new trading and rebalance. And then go look at there and then go analyze those. So when it comes to AI, so much is changing so fast. There's so much out there. How, you know, how do firms that say, all right, I've identified my pain point. I've identified you know areas that I need to improve from a process standpoint to make sure the data is better. Now I'm ready to dabble. Okay. How do, where do I go? How do I go about finding, staying up to date? Because everything is changing so quickly inside the AI world these days. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of great thought leaders who are putting out, you know, really good content. But honestly, I think when you are looking to especially create operational efficiencies, going to, you know, some of those um, platforms where they're you know, putting out content around how you build workflow automation, for instance, you know, checking some of those things out. What I'll say is always look at your existing tech stack first, you know, because they are integrating new AI tools and features all the time. So there is no need for you to look outside of that if, for instance, you have master service level agreements where you're tied into some sort of infrastructure, go try those tools first and see if you can get the value out of them, right? Um, and uh, and other if you if 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 you need to supplement some of those uh, tools, what I say is is just try some without 
going toward like huge enterprise level agreements because you may find that the, you know, the tool of the moment doesn't actually work for your team. And so mm. taking a kind of lean startup um, approach of build a proof of concept, test that proof of concept, see if it is going to provide your team with value, and then start to think about what other investments do we need to make to, in order to scale this value. Yeah, I love that. Start small. And and you'll also gain the the trust of your team doing that more often because yeah. they won't you won't be putting them through the ringer to uh, there's multiple failures that come along the way. I I, I want to try something here because you you've you've consulted so many companies you understand AI you understand how to create efficient processes leveraging technology. I want to I want to provide a process that happens okay. within wealth management and I'd love to dissect it and we can answer questions we can dive into it. I'll set up a scenario. But I'd love to dissect it and see how, you know, a firm that's doing it this way, how I describe it, can maybe think about using AI and efficiencies in, uh, to better uh, create that process. So yep. let's just talk about the, let's talk about the review, like a, a current client review meeting. Let's talk okay. about that process, right? So, you know, and this isn't for everybody. It's just like, a, I'm just trying to take a standard one, right? So you have, um, you know, your CRM you have a uh, an upcoming meeting deliverable. So then the, a team member, usually on the operations team, reaches out, schedules the meeting. Some people use Calendly. They send it through email, et cetera. And then the client schedules the meeting. And then about you know a couple of days before, a week before, the, the team prepares for that meeting, pulling notes from past meetings, pulling the financial plan, reviewing the financial plan, thinking about talking points, um, you know, reviewing the estate plan, the tax plan, et cetera. There's like a checklist that they go through. Right. They check beneficiaries, they check performance, they check asset allocation. And then they go into the meeting and they present this and they talk through it with the client. And they have action items for the client to do to execute on the plan. They have action items for them. They have all these notes. They go back, they type them into the CRM, they put the tasks in, and then they go and execute. So let's start with that process, right? That's not, I mean, that's, I know that everybody does it a little bit differently, but from a high level, that kind of gives a, a process. Let's dissect that. How, how can we make that process more efficient yeah. uh, using AI? Yeah. So there are so many touch points in there real quick. And, you know, and I'll even, I'll even touch a little bit on, you know, just using automation in general between, uh, di between things. Um, but if you think about your, uh, your action, your action items, your tasks, and your CRM, those are all, you know, pieces of, um, you know, these are, these are all pieces of data that can easily be connected to each other, right? And so, you know, and I think about any time, you know, I've built flows where it's like, okay, I have a new client call. So, or, you know, uh, one of these upcoming client review sessions, right? Um, and I know it's going to happen. And so there's a little bit of, there's a trigger for automating that scheduling um, to connect two calendars together. So humans don't actually have to do it if we've set this thing up right. Um, or you can, but uh, I, I've typically automated that. Um, and then you think about like all these call notes, right? Or all these team notes or meeting notes that you've had leading up to the preparation of this meeting. So when um, I typically always use some sort of AI transcription service, um, I really like fireflies.ai, Otter is another one, um, but they do really great transcriptions of your calls. And so you can customize the summary reports to pull out certain things that you are really concerned with for informing the next action or informing the next meeting. So whether or not it's next steps, whether or not it's specific, um, you know, uh, specific uh, problems they need solved or things that they need addressed or specific services you're going to offer, those call notes, you can um, you can feed that into uh, what I call, like in my case, I call it a scoping document and I have a scoping process. But you guys probably have like whatever that deliverable is. Maybe it's the plan. But you have an approach for building these plans internally. And so if we teach AI to understand that approach, 
we can actually have the call notes filtered into that approach filter and you get a first draft of um, a first draft kind of deliverable, you know, project plan um, that you, then you can start building out more and reacting to depending on how many fields you're, you know, filling out and whatnot. And so, so like, even though you're not going to take out the advisor because the advisor is the one who actually knows what's going on um, and can also like cry bullshit on some things, you know, if AI has messed it up or, you know, misconstrued some things. Um, so I build into my processes a ton of breaks where you have to have a human interaction and say maybe even you change a true false statement statement in a spreadsheet that triggers the next action. And so like even you're talking about um, logging tasks, nobody should ever have to log tasks at all at this point in a project management tool. AI can do that for us. And it can also schedule the next thing, you know, if we have to come together once that task has been completed. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, I want to touch on a few of those points, right? So if we start from the beginning, it's a matter of <laughs> automating the meeting scheduling. Like I even, as I was thinking, is like, is there an opportunity for clients to link up their calendar to my calendar? And there's not even a correspondence. It's just like, hey, it's gone on the calendar. Like that's super interesting. Every, there's a lot of people probably like, they. I, I bet you they cringed. They, and I said that because it's like, <laughs> it's a little bit, it's like, ooh, that's a little bit like Two hands overstepping off. my boundaries. Yeah, and it's not white glove enough. But maybe that is an efficiency that our clients really like and really want. Maybe it's not. Maybe you give that option. But, you know, it's the automation and of sending out that Calendly link based on the task being due in your CRM. Tools like uh, Zapier or, or Pipedrive, I think, or Pipe, uh, uh, I forget the Pipe Dream or whatever it may be. Yeah, exactly. uh, connect, connect and can do that. But then the idea of using like a transcription service. Now, again, people probably cringe. It's a little bit different for our industry because of the compliance aspect. But wow. remember, a lot of these tools have gone through a lot of compliance and work with highly compliant industries. A lot of doctors use transcription services now. Uh, you know, I've had Corey yeah. Westfall of Mobile Assistant on multiple times, and I love what they're doing. And they have a transcription service. Uh, but if you don't want to use something like that, you can use like an Otter or Fireflies for Zoom meetings or even in person, you can transcript it. But the idea of the next step, right? Nobody wants to go and read a full-on transcript, but you can feed that transcript through an AI engine that then is trained on the formula to ask questions. What was the biggest, what was the most talked about point? What was the, what were the outcomes? What were the tasks? What were the objectives covered? And you can train that engine chat GPT allows you to do that now it can basically ask questions based on that transcript and oh, then sure. provide you a deliverable that then you can then either send over to your crm send over to an ops assistant or to an investment associate that can review it make sure that there's a human element and what this is doing is it's just eliminating that menial stuff so that humans can do what we do best which is helping to interpret the data helping to the, interpret the human helping to direct the conversation um and then automating all the rest of his stuff and ha like you said, connecting that AI engine to a CRM. That's super interesting. Now to get that done, you gotta have some processes, you gotta have some clean data, you have to have all that. Uh, but that is a one way of doing it, uh, which is super interesting. For sure, for sure. And like things like Otter and Fireflies, you don't even have to push out to a chat GPT. It already, like they are their own AI, right? And so they um, they have already done some of that for you. Uh, one thing people need to think about is regardless of whether you're recording or you are using an AI assistant or whatever, if you are using Zoom, Zoom has already said in your license agreement, they are training their AI using your call transcripts, even if you're not recording. So um, we have all uh, sort of authorized some of these programs to do things that we might not be aware of. You may have just you may have just spurred a lot of phone calls to Zoom for a lot of people listening to this because they're going to go check to see if that's the case for them. But it, 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 I mean, these companies they own the data. Everybody wants to own the data. This is why data is so valuable is for situations Very like nice. this. So that, I appreciate you going through that with me. That was that was fun. It's a good exercise to see kind of how to think about it. You got to think from start to end. Where are all the connection points? What know. are the action items? And then where are the opportunity? Not everything's going to have an opportunity. And you've got, I think where I've seen, you know, struggles before, even with us is, you know, you try to automate something that you really want to automate, but it's just not ready to be automated yet. Yeah. And 
that ruins it. So you've got to be caught and say, hey, I'm going to put this, I'm going to shelve this, but I'm going to automate this and, and try to find that low hanging fruit. Well, and even think about the baby steps within that workflow. Like I want to work, I want to automate this whole thing. Well, I can't because of this breaking point here and here. Okay, well, automate those other three areas. You know, you can still get value even if you can't do an end-to-end -end automation. Yep, it's not an all or nothing. I, I no, agree 100% with that. I, I want to dive into one other thing before we close this out and let you get back to, to building your business is um, I know that you've consulted and worked with a lot of large organizations, uh, you know, Home Depot, Coca-Cola, the likes. You know, these, these are companies that are are super innovative inside of a large infrastructure. They have a large infrastructure. Now they have budget. They, they're always thinking forward thinking. They're trying to find the next thing. They, they're just, they're not sitting on their laurels or resting on their laurels. How, what have you learned from working with those companies on, on how those types of companies like Coke, let's just use Coke and Home Depot specifically, uh, given that we're in Atlanta and Atlanta brands, but how do they keep their teams and ensure that they are always staying innovative and that they're staying forward thinking? What are what are the the, the underlying processes and mentality and infrastructure and you know outside of just spending money? Right. Um, you know what is what have you learned from them that we can distill? Because I, I'm a huge fan of saying, hey, let's look outside of our walls, outside of our industry, at how others are doing it, big and small. Mm -hmm. and let's learn something from them. And so. What is what does Coke and Home Depot do well when it comes to staying innovative? Um, I think <laughs> I think that they market their innovation story really, really well. <laughs> um, you know, the truth is, is these big companies have a terrible time innovating, and it's not specific Co Coke, specific Home Depot. Have they done have moments of like incredible innovation? Absolutely. But if you think about continuous innovation. I think what we see is that the core business is always going to get the attention. And so when you are looking at new domains, you know, outside of the people you serve today, or maybe it's just new product spaces with the same people you serve today, those don't ever get the, I, I think, get the investment that they often deserve um, because there's so much focus on the core business. Also, because of that focus on the core business and because they're really good at building that core business, they apply the same rigor and the same, you know, expectations of what success criteria look like to innovation. And that's not actually the way innovation should be measured. And you also do not want to encumber innovation with say, enterprise-level software agreements, you know? So if you're trying to spin up a small new venture and really wanting to see, test the market, see if there's a market there, find product market fit, like you don't want to be really encumbered by a, you know, one-year Salesforce marketing cloud, you know, integration. Like you might want to just throw up something scrappy, you know? Um, and so I just think that there's not this... Um, mindset about I need to be a startup founder inside a big company mm. and think like a startup and like allow failure to happen so that we get to success faster. The idea of the focus on the core business that it's put on the same expectations and through the same rigor and judged by the same KPIs as the core businesses. Yeah. I see that all the time. And 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 so then I, I guess the follow-up question to that is I, how have you seen companies that are good at innovation? Maybe you can name the companies if you'd want that are really good. How have they overcome that? Because what I when I think about that answer, I always think that if if a large company like Coca-Cola is unable to have at least a small division focus on you know new ideas, given that that core business is likely going to sustain because of how big it already is, mm -hmm. you know, a small business is like you know they have they have the allocation of capital decisions and it's going to be hard to focus on anything outside of the core business. So, you know, at any stage of your business cycle life, you're going to always be focused on the core business and you're always going to say and judge everything relative to that core business. And so for a company that wants to innovate, how do you overcome that based on what you've seen some companies that have done it really, really well? Mm -hmm. I think part of it is really having rigor around learning plans and what are you going into market to learn? Is it, you know, that you're 
looking to learn if there is a customer segment? Or are you looking to learn if there's a product need? Or are you looking to learn if this is a scalable business? You know, so we're like really hitting on, you know, all the illities there. Um, and, and really putting, I think, you know, first of all, you have to have buy-in from the top that we need multiple lines in the water to figure out what our relevancy looks like in 10 to 15 to 20 years, right? Just because we're a leader in this space right now doesn't mean that we will be a leader in this space in 20 years when disrupted by, by other things. Um, uh, you know, have worked with, you know, several organizations that I think have done um, innovation well. And I've seen them build things, um, uh, you know, as part of a new venture or, you know, like a new innovation pod or whatever that eventually get pulled into the core business, you know. And so th those innovations have been successful, like a nationwide insurance, for instance, or, um, you know, uh, worked with a lot of banks over time, um, you know, just to put out new consumer products that solve a problem in a slightly different way. And so I think that all, honestly, and it's also about keeping the customer inside of the focus and continually micro testing all along the way to making sure you're actually solving value, because that's the thing that people will buy is if you're doing something that is so necessary to their every day. I love the idea of having this mentality from the top. It definitely does start from the top. And the top needs to understand that it's two different verticals and they should be viewed differently yeah. and that you need multiple lines in the water to understand where you are 5, 10, 15 years. So you're not reactionary. You're proactive in that nature. And you look at a lot of these big companies that have done it. You know, I think about, you know, Philips, for instance, was all around, you know, uh, lighting. And yeah. now, like, they're into healthcare tech. Like, two drastically right. different. And to, to your point of what you said, what made me remember that was – when you're like, well, what you are today may not be what you are in 10 to 15 years, and you've got mm -hmm. to be ready to transition. They were lighting. Now they're healthcare tech. Like right. drastically different things. And that was their business. And now this is their business. And the reason they were able to do that, well, a lot of things probably that are underneath it, but they had this idea and acceptance of saying, we may not be who we are today in the future. And we've got to figure out that now. So because of how long it takes to make that transition go forward. Yeah. It's so hard. Absolutely. Yeah. Sarah, this has been amazing. I mean, I could talk about this stuff um, all day, every day. Uh, it's super interesting. I love your perspective on it. I think that you've got such great uh, insight and, and experience. So I, I appreciate the time. Uh, before I let you go, and um, I, I want to ask two questions I ask all my guests before they leave. But first is, I, I love learning through books. And so I like to ask my guests what books are, are best ones to read. What's one book out there you think that everybody should read, whether it's on the topic of AI or, or not. Um, what is one of those books that you think that everybody should read or reread out there today? Yeah. So for any of us who are in, you know, in professional services, working with clients, I say this, the workshop survival guidebook, this is how to design and teach workshops that work every time. And so that's not necessarily like I have to just design workshops. But think about every client call you're on. What's the experience you want to create for them? How do you facilitate really great conversations? Um, so that one is has changed a lot of the way I think about designing uh, client experiences. So I love that one. Sorry, I had to crawl under my couch to get it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I saw you post that on LinkedIn and I actually went out and bought it. It's on the bookshelf in my ready to read uh, area. So I'm looking forward to reading that one. That one. It's so uh, good. Second question is we talked about a lot and we, there's probably a lot that we didn't talk about that maybe you did want to talk about, but um, what is one piece of actionable advice our listeners can walk away from this conversation that you hope that they can walk away from this conversation uh, with that they can implement today, tomorrow to better themselves, their business, whatever it may be. Uh, what's one piece of actionable advice for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, get out and start playing with some tools and just see what uh, AI can do within your own workflow. So if you have, you know, played with it at all, um, you know, you've started to see, okay, it can do some things, but maybe it's not like the be all and all answer to everything. Well, figure out why and start just um, being able to kind of analytically pick apart why ChatGPT responses are terrible. That will start to help you figure out how you make them good, right? So just 
keep practicing so you know how to um, talk to the engine. The next thing I will say is keep it simple. Like I am not a designer. So even in a year and a half of playing with AI tools, like mid journey is still not my thing. I'm not doing pretty pictures. Like I'm a writer and I'm a business person. So like I like process, you know? Um, so, you know, figure out what is going to work for you and, and forget about what other people are saying. Like if you're listening to this, you're already ahead. Like 90% of industries are way behind, behind in quotes. This is a journey and we're at the start of it. So there's no time like the present. Just figure out what it can do for you. And if you think there's a problem that could solve it, there probably is. Um, and, uh, you know, let's figure it out. It certainly is a skill and, and skills take practice, take time in it. And, uh, you can theorize, you can read, you can, but the, there's no better learning than doing, doing. um, and so I, I think that that's such great advice. Well, well, Sarah, like I said, this was an incredible conversation. I really do appreciate, uh, your time. Uh, I'm, I'm motivated. I'm inspired. I can't wait to follow your journey. I know that others will want to continue to follow your journey as well. So what's the best way for people to continue to follow you, to get in touch with you and maybe even potentially work with you, uh, in your new endeavor? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me at AIgrowthops.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn as Sarah Woodward. I am the LinkedIn dot whatever Sarah Woodward. So I'm easy to find. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I post stuff all the time cause I want to get people curious and I want to show people what is possible because a lot of people don't know what's possible. So follow along. I am not going to, you know, share all the legislation and stuff like that. I'm just showing practical tips. I love it. It's a good follow. She's been, she's in my feed. Uh, we've been connected, uh, for a while, so it's definitely worth the follow. Sarah Woodward, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Be well, stay well, and we will talk with you again soon. Thank you.